How do you do, do folks? I have a hungry cat. Look, I've just put some food out for you, Twinks. I've just put some out for you. Look, it's there. Fresh biscuits and some cat food. Come on, is it there? You're not listening to me, are you, puss? I have tea. Very hot tea. And a very meowy cat. I put some in your bowl. Go and have a look. I'm not going to take you over there. I have to take my mics off. Hope you're doing well, folks. I'm streaming on a second successful, successive night. That's successful. Because we um, obviously left the stream last night with the uh, uh, GPIO structuring issues. So I wanted to return to that. So what are you going to do, Twinkles? Hmm? Let's have a look to everyone back. Hey, look who's here. Crystal's here, look. Are you going to go and see if there's anything in your bowl? I just put something there for you. You just want attention, don't you? Now you're not coming from my lap drinks because I've got to do this stream. Hi Laurie. So which way? Are you in or are you out, Twinks? I've got to shut that door. Make your mind up time. So uh, what I want to do is return to that code, obviously, in a minute. But before then, um, probably worth going over a conversation that we had earlier, where we revisited the, um, the conversation, really. We went into a bit more depth. On the um, on our Discord channels, and we were talking about um, the use cases. Damn it! My glasses are smoked up again. And we were we were going through the possible variants, different ways that something like an amalgam board would be used, and the different circumstances. In many cases, it appears that having a USB storage device still works really well. Um, so if you want to get new firmware on there, then you can do that. If you want a new FPGA image, you can do that. That's all very easy to do over a file system or a mass storage device that's mounted over USB. Um, where it becomes a bit more sticky is... In the cases of when you're debugging, for example, then you need a different kind of communication, something like a serial or HID type implementation. And I was looking at the possibility of doing a kind of DAP link. And a DAP link is a combinational link. So that will have a mixture of um, serial and um, HID type devices on USB. And that's certainly possible for those. Some of the others that we had less insight into was, um, or the things that are more trickier, things like some of the existing uh, retro stuff that's done for Black Ice, whereby the retro synthesis. Um, has basically something that emulates what used to be a floppy disk or a cassette based interface or some such. And the way that that is done is you need to run something on the uh, microcontroller that will talk to the FPGA, you know, over a serial device or something like that in order to provide it with the data it needs to load into RAM or whatever it may be. Um, <coughs> uh, 
<coughs> what were the other ones, Laurie, that we got stuck on? I can't remember off the top of my head. I should open Discord, really, and look back at that. Oh yeah, Saxon Sock, when that's running Linux or Litex, there is some kind of, um, so Saxon Sock needs to find, <coughs> what does it need to find? It needs to find a boot image, right? Crinkle, plus you need to be able to see the serial output, I guess. So there's still a good argument to have uh, that as well. I mean, the serial could be done through the microcontroller as normal. Um, on something like an amalgam device, I think oh, I'm hoping to have two USB interfaces. So one could be used for debug, for example, and the other can be used as mesh storage. Uh, the debug one could be debug, it could be serial. Or it could be a combination. If I could do um, multiple classes on one USB serial, then I could do something like a, uh, I think it's Daplink that ARM do. And Daplink is like a, a grouping of different things. So I think it combines serial um, and it defines, it, it might even define like a um, storage part and also a HID part. And I think the HID part is used um, for the kind of GDB-like or debug type application where you have this command response occurring. So ideally that's where we'd like to get to. So I think at a base level, probably a USB storage device on one USB and then potentially a second USB where that's available, depending on which um, which board you're using, whether that, you know, is possible or not. Um, then a, the second USB could carry the debug or serial stuff. I mean, it is possible to do multiple classes on a single USB, but it gets difficult for a number of reasons, including bandwidth uh, and how much time it takes off the microcontroller's hands, of course. What's Laurie saying here? Saxon Sock uses boot images in flash memory. The UART, both input and output, an external JTAG device. With the JTAG thing, what we'd have is there is a there are several pins. Okay, so if I look at the amalgam board, um, we've got two sets of connections between the STM32 and the um, um, okay, hold on. Let me draw this one up if I can. Let me see if I can um, use the pad. Are you still, still looking? My cat's just sitting there looking at me, waiting expectantly. I've just put food on the bowl. I don't know what she wants. I think she's just in attention mood. It's actually supper time, Twinkle. You normally eat at this time. Are you just not un hungry? Uh, let me see if I can... Let's see if I can share... Uh, um uh, uh, uh let me get this up. Um Meow, yes. I can hear you twinkle. What is it that you want though? I don't understand. Hmm? Oh, hold on, it's just updating um, itself automatically when I run it. So let me just let that finish. I hope it doesn't want to try and restart the machine, otherwise I will be peed off. So 
already decided that it needs to update itself without my permission. Um, do you want to go out, Twinkle? Bear with me a sec, guys. Let's see if I can work out what this cat wants. Ah, you do want to go out. Oh, nice. Favourite combination. <laughs> Ah, it's a really slow download too. It's going to take a while. Um, so what else is Laurie saying here? The oh, wait a minute. Bogus. It doesn't have optional VGA. It does have optional VGA or HDMI output. Well, we will have on the amalgam board, for example. There will be a HDMI output. Um, what else? It needs a directly connected SD card. Well, that's easy enough to do. I'm not sure. I need to have a think about whether that actually fits on the board, but potentially I could wire that in. That's not a problem. Because the STM32 will have an SD card, but it's a low bandwidth affair, it's not a high priority. That would just be SPI, that won't be 4 bit MMC or anything. Um, it can use RM2 Ethernet. Well, you could always add a board that does that. I've got all the components to build one of those actually. I do need to sit down. I did lay one out as a PMOD, but just never got round to um, actually building it. Um, it can use serial networking, PPPD, to a coprocessor like an ESP or a STM32. Yeah. What were the other cases that we missed? Was just whilst we're chatting, Laurie, must I wait for this? damn software update did I I can't work out whether my chairs lower down or whether my camera's actually moved I think it's the chair my chair is less squeaky because it's a new chair however it does make a really loud noise in some positions uh, retro computing with on screen display yeah so the retro computing with on-screen display, how does that need to work? I need to properly understand that line. So basically what you need for this to work is the micro in this case would need to drive a display and have user interface input, am I correct? Because that user would then need to look at the display, choose from a menu. The STM would then choose which bit image from the SD card and then load the FPGA up with that. That's what you're thinking, right? That's where you basically write a front end for the OSD. So you write a bit of firmware that does that. But that requires that the um, that requires that the STM32 in this case, or the micro, whatever that is, has some sort of display attached. And I have no way of doing that on Amalgam because I've already used all the pins up. I mean, one one thing that it could do. Let's just read what uh, Lori said. It heavily uses a link between the FPGA and the coprocessor. On the ULX3, that uses an SPI. On the Mister, it uses 
bus link does not need a display oh good sends display data to the fpga right well that's easy so i mean so that sounds doable then in that case God, where are we in this? 38 of 53 megabytes. I hope it doesn't take too much memory in this run. I feel like I'm definitely smaller or lower down. This is really weird. Let me just check my chair hasn't um I think that's up to maximum height. Hmm. I just need to make sure I do not slouch. Sit upright, it's a bit uncomfortable to sit fully upright unless I push the chair right in. Um, well, we're nearly there 48. So, the FPG, right, so how it works. So, the FPGA sends an interrupt to the coprocessor. The coprocessor responds by reading the flash an SS, SDD card file system directory listing. To the FPGA, so it's acting like a remote file system almost. Oh, now it's installing. Sorry, folks, I didn't realize that this would happen. Checking for upgrades. <laughs> it's just updated itself. How weird. Right, so let's share this live view. Live view is connecting. My view on. That doesn't seem to be live viewing. Wow, that is weird. We've got burning. Damn, that's annoying. I never noticed that before.
Um, accept live view, yes. Thank you. I'll do this landscape, that'd be nice. Page set up. Hold on, I need to change this. Need to put it into a landscape view, and I need to turn my view back on. Let me see if I can turn this on so that you guys can see it. So let me just catch up on what Laurie's saying. Um, hello, Twinks, you're back now. Oh, no. <sighs> right, so Laurie's saying going up and down, user can navigate a display using buttons or an input device, uh, going up and down through directories. Does that device need to be, those buttons need to be connected to the FPGA or the STM32? Um, it can then select a file to load. The file is remotely written to the FPGA, RAM by the bus or the SPI RAM interface. The soft core CPU is usually halted whilst that happens. Again, remotely from the coprocessor. The CPU is then reset and executes an uploaded file. Is usually a game ROM. The OSD is turned off once the file is selected, a variant of this for home computers rather than game consoles is to emulate a floppy disk. For that, when a floppy disk track is read, an interrupt is sent to the coprocessor, which responds by sending back the selected track. Um, on the ULX 3S, the link is SPI memory link, usually with a 32-bit address and 8-bit data. The buttons are connected to the FPGA, right? So let's draw up what we've got. So basically, um, damn it. Hmm. Let me just turn this off again. I need to change the page setup. Template I need what do I need? I don't like that. That will do. Uh, let me turn this back on again and republish. The white has to have a margin. <clears throat> so, um, basically, what we've got here, we've got the FPGA, right? Let's just get the pen. Uh, 
Um, let's draw these two devices first. So we've got the STM, and then we've got the ECP5. Connected into the STM, we have potentially uh, two USBs. So the main USB, which is probably a mass storage device, and then the other one is possibly a uh, CDC USB. Um, now I think what I'm budgeting for in terms of connectivity I mean the main big connection here this one and what I'm drawing here is the um, the amalgam the higher end type board right so that has that no this is wrong um, where's my where's the undo button normally there's an undo is that gone? Damn. Let's do it the hard way then. So, um, Actually, on this side, that's called FMC. I was caught out with this earlier. I should call it what it is. And the interface between the two is kind of a... Um, it's split into two things, but the interface is like a PS RAM. And it's muxed. So it has, you know, 16 data plus an extra um, four plus three, seven for address, plus a bunch of control lines. So it's basically a 16-bit word interface, but it, it's a bit wider for the address. It's like a 23-bit address. You know, the whole bus is like 27, 28 pins, something like that. So it's a nice high speed, fast, high width bus. So we can move information between the two very quickly over that. Then the other thing we have here is um, a spy connection. The SPI connection is for um, IOs. Um, so the SPI connection here is primarily used at startup to actually program the ECP5. Let me just catch up on what um, Laurie's saying here. The buttons are connected to the FPGA. Okay, that's cool. In the SBI memory link, some addresses are used for control purposes, such as resetting or halting the CPU. The link is read, written, but the SBI master is the coprocessor. Okay, so it's reversing the role. So in that case, the microcontroller becomes the um, SBI slope, is what, um, what Laurie's saying here.
the FPGA decides what the interrupt is by reading a specific control memory address. Okay, so in other words, I think um, I'm assuming what, what's going on here is the S. I better draw in the link, so I'm going to need an interrupt as well. Let's put that here. Um, the FPGA decides what the interrupt is by reading. Yeah, so once you get this interrupt, we can then read the internal register in the ECP5. We can read that over the SPI or we can read that over the FMC, by the way. Um, as well as address and data, there is a read and write control signal. Uh, the MIST and the MISTER and the SPECTRUM next versions of this are a bit different and use a bus interface rather than an SPA emulated bus interface. Um, all this really needs an SD card connected to the coprocessor. Right, so what I have connected to the card, to the um, STM32 is I have a, uh, you know, a SD, but that's just an SPI. It's not particularly fast, but it's fast enough for our application. Um, uh, what else do we have now? Obviously, we have a flash on here as well, and that should be. Quad SPI or SPI, but on the amalgam board, it's Quad SPI. Um, There's a whole crap load of stuff connected to the ECP5 which I haven't drawn in here. Um, all this really needs is an SD card connected to the coprocessor. Yeah, so the SD cards really need to be connected to both the FPGA and the coprocessor. Well, what I was thinking is we could separately connect an SD card. Because it's easy to do that. And that would be, you know, MMC. And that would be, uh, you know, a six wire connection so that you can optionally do that. Uh, assuming I can physically fit it on the board, that's not expensive to add that in. Um, and it could overlap with the existing pins on the ECP5 that are going out to the... Um, address bus. The big thing going off here, by the way, is, uh, you know, the IO connector on the module. And that's 64 bits. Available. Um, that's for expansion. Um, also on the ADC we have, sorry, also on the STM32 we have an ADC, you know, we have, um, oh, what am I doing? Uh, we have 14 ADCs. Damn it. I've lost my undo. It's really weird.
Um, we also have CAM and I2C. Um, on the ECB5, we have um, we have a MIPI out. We have two uh, C S two cameras. in and we have potentially another a USB as well we have oh yes we have HDMI or DV I should say out Um, and we might also have USB, which is a low bandwidth affair, and it might only be single USB. Um, I think I've covered all the bases there. Hi, A Post. How you doing? I think we've also got at least one button. I don't know how many buttons we need. Probably two. Um, let's just catch up on what Laurie's saying here whilst I've been annotating the diagram. So first of all, there's likely to be two separate SD card sockets. One which connect, is connected to the FPGA ECP5 and one which is connected to the um, uh, STM32. Um, there will be an interrupt line. There will be four SBI connections, and there will be the um, MUX PS RAM connection or the FMC, which is about 27 or 28 pins between the FPGA and the ECP5. Sorry, the uh, STM and the ECP5. Uh, on the UX3, my port. Of Hoggle B and Atom access the SD card from the FPGA. But you still got that choice potentially here. I don't know which way is better to do it. Remember on the ECB5, you've got a lot more resources than you had on uh, the HX on uh, Black Ice. Yeah, I'm good, I post. Did you, were you did you watch the stream last night at Interest Time Post? So Laurie's saying on the ULX three, the ADCs are connected to the FPGA. There's quite a nice oscilloscope implementation that uses them called Scope IO, which uses its HDMI. So is that like a spy device, Laurie? I mean, the FPGA could query the ADCs from the STM if it wanted to over at SPI when it's in slave mode, that wouldn't be an issue. Um, 
Okay, no problem on my post. It's just we're going to carry on from some of the code that we uh, started from yesterday. Um, you didn't miss much. I'll, I'll do a review anyhow. Um, we spent most of the time scratching our head going, you know, WTF. Um, at the moment, what we're just going through is we're trying to imagine the use cases effectively for Black Crab um, because... You know, we had a brief discussion about it yesterday on the stream, and then we had more discussions about it this afternoon on the um, discourse channel. So we're just trying to go through the all the different use cases that we've already seen, you know, where um, black ice has been used, but also look at um, um, any new potential ones as well, and how we can, you know, we're probably not going to get all of the software done you know at once but we can start getting we can prioritize certain parts of it over other parts etc oh yeah you did see the post on discord this afternoon because you asked about the uh, tiny fpga bootloader support so um you've got some insight to what we're talking about here which is good so given that um diagram Laurie you've got several choices really I mean so after after the and then after an image is hmm. so it, it's obviously it must be like a two-stage process right because the STM32 must program the ECP5 with whatever it needs to run the OSD so there must be like a base uh, image for the ECB5 when it's in OSD mode. Is that right? Is that is my assumption correct there? And that enables the ECB5 or the, the synthesis that's running in the ECB5 to be a master on the SPI that talks to the STM32 that requests the file list. And then um, chooses that, and then that once that conversation's finished and the choice has been made, the STM32 then knows which image has been selected off the SD card, and it will reset the ECP5 with the new image that's been requested. The OSD and the PS RAM slave is included in the synthesis. So it's not like a separate synthesis itself, then. It's included in all of the synthesis, is what you're saying. That part of it. So each of the images includes that functionality. Oh, you're saying that the FPGA is the SPI slave for the PSM. I'm getting mixed up then. So the STM32 remains the master. So all the STM32 is doing at this point is it's reading the SD card or the flash, wherever it's stored, and it's offering a directory list over SPI and then the signal is coming back i.e. via an interrupt or the master on the STM32 reads certain registers in the ECB5 in order to decide what its next move is right Yeah, so the FPGA pulls the interrupt down. The SPI then go and inter interrogates a certain address over the SPI, right? And gets a response. Yeah, it reads a control register. Okay. 
I mean, it, it wouldn't actually need to do that over SPI. It could actually do that over the uh, FMC. However, the retro application would then need to support some sort of bus which the FMC could connect to, and that may be a bit overcomplicating it a bit. Maybe just using SPI is a simple way of doing it because presumably that's how it's been implemented in the previous um, versions, right? Well, that's simple enough to do. There's no, there's no, pro I don't see any problem with doing that. That's nice and simple. Um, and the good thing is it doesn't have to reverse the roles of master and slave on the SPI, which is a pain in the ass to have to do that. Where it has to, you know, where the STM32 switches between those two modes. If it can remain master, then it's easy. Yeah, I mean, so Laurie's saying here that, um, yes, I would like to change to use FMC. An FMC slave should be simpler than an SPI slave. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on it. I mean, there's less shifting in and out, obviously, Laurie, but there's a whole bunch of control signals with, you know, um, you've got, you've got a clock, you've got a dress valid, you've got burst signal lines, you've got um, data valid. There's a whole bunch, basically. It's not like a minimum pin count thing. It's frustratingly complicated in terms of lots of pins. But actually, from an FPGA point of view, it's actually quite simple to implement. And it's certainly quicker. Because you don't have the shifting. The other thing is, um, what you can do is you can actually memory map it. That's the really cool thing about using the FMC unit, because if you memory map it, um, then you're as far as the STM32 side of things goes, it's just accessing a register inside the um, synthesis over the FMC but you need to implement it properly on the ECP5 side. Um, and Laurie's saying, um, yeah, an FMC slave should be simpler than an SPI slave, but once we have a very log version of the FMC PS RAM slave, we can include it in retro implementations. Sure. It'd be relatively easy to do an FMC slave that just access registers. It's a bit more complicated if you want to actually integrate the FMC into a bus that exists, you know, inside the FPGA in, in the synthesis. Then you've got a lot more things to worry about. But um, yeah, if it's just registers, it should be dead simple or even the direct memory interface because that's the other thing is you could actually um, not just have registers but you could actually map the internal block memory or SRAM or anything connected to the HP5 into that as well if you wanted to including for example a flash uh, if that was connected to the uh, ECP5 or SD RAM or DDR2 RAM. No, okay. um, each retro implementation decides what sort of RAM it wants to read and write. For some, they use BRAM, some SD RAM. Yeah, so all I'm saying there is you can actually have the FMC bridge inside the uh, ECP5 synthesis 
that not only talks to registers but could actually talk to any of the RAM, whichever one it is, you know, VRAM or SDRAM that you've mapped into the retro implementation itself. So that's the other way that you can do things, if that's any easier. I don't know if that's easier for the retro situations. I've noticed that the uh, hold on that the um, hmm it's squishing my drawing some. What if I do shift to make it less squishy? Probably better. Less squished. So yes, talking to the RAM is essential, said Laurie. Yeah, well, as long as you can, you know, take the PS RAM signals, which is basically, you know, a bunch of address and control lines with a 16-bit data path muxed onto the same lower 16-bit pins, assuming you can convert that to control the memory that you wish to write to, then it's a fairly trivial process. So, so I think we're covered for that. I don't think we have to do anything extra. I mean, the ESP5 obviously has a display, you know, by using the built-in HDMI. You could even add a VGA if you wanted to by, um, you know, connecting it to the I.O. section. Um, there is a potential for, um, oh, wait a minute, there's a MIPI output as well. So if you didn't, so if you're in a situation where, say you were making a, like a gaming console with an LCD screen, you could use an, a MIPI LCD screen. That's the other thing, because that will be supported by the amalgam. If you wanted to go the whole hog. The ULX3 uses a 32-bit address. Uh, well, we're using up to, what, 23 bits. That will certainly be able to map in anything that you need. You wouldn't need more than that, I wouldn't have thought, for these sort of applications. Basically, what you're do doing is you're fooling the STM into thinking that you've connected up a PS RAM chip. that has a muxed uh, bus. That's what's going on here. That's what you're doing. So you're just re recreating that inside the FPGA. Twenty three bits is tight for the address range plus control registers. Is it really how much space do you need? So 23 bits, right? That's two, uh, hold on, two to the 23. That's eight meg uh, times two, because it's 16 bit um, data path. So that's 16, 16 meg.
So the Eurolex 3 also emulates a PS RAM over SPI. Yeah, that's slightly different because that's a slower interface, but yeah. This is a wider interface. But yeah, 2 to the 23 is basically 8 meg. 8 megabytes. Um, but because it's 16 bits wide, that's effectively 16 megabytes. Because you arrange it as two lots of eight or whatever. But actually, you want to arrange it as 16 bit. So you've got eight mega byte times two. You need at least one bit for control signal. There's a whole bunch of secondary uh, control signals on the bus that are separate from the 23 bits. Larry. I'm just talking about the address and data pins being 23 bits. In fact, is it, yeah, I think it's 23 bits. I don't understand your extra control signals. Oh, you're just thinking of it addressing the control registers themselves. Well, how much memory are you talking about? Because the control registers are only, you know, a handful, right? You don't need one bit. The, the registers just fit into the memory map somewhere. Thirty two megabyte of memory is sometimes used. I'm not sure if we can stretch to that. Uh, I don't want to open it now because it takes up loads of memory. I could open up what I've put in, but I <clears throat> hold on. I'm pretty sure. Hold on. Maybe I can open the image. I might have saved an image of it. Bear with me. Um, wow, this is really slow. That's definitely the wrong one. Hold on. I'll, I'll tell you exactly how many I've allocated. Uh, this may take memory. Hope I don't drop frames or some opening all this. This is the uh, stupid, inefficient STM32 CubeFX software. Just eats memory for breakfast and processor cycles, <laughs> which is bonkers considering it's not that complicated. <laughs> um, I know you're saying, but you could write the address into two or more writes. Yes, you could, but then you couldn't, couldn't use the automatic addressing if you did that. You'd have to manually write that, but it's possible, yeah. Um, oh, it's gone to sleep now. Um, oh, this is so slow.
just having a look at the pins to see what my options are here. I mean, I've literally used all of the pins. I can show you briefly what that looks like, if you like. Uh, hold on. Damn, this is slow. Slowing everything to a crawl. Uh. <laughs> Let me just load this up so that you can see it, guys. Hold on. And then you can see what I'm looking at here. So that's the pinouts on the STM32, right? Well, it's slightly um, cut off. Can you see? So on here, um, the highest pin is uh, A22. And it starts at AD0, which is 23 bits. So that gives us a 16. Uh, you need part of the address range in, for on-screen data as well, but could use the same bit as a control register. You could also address SD-RAM plus BRAM plus flash, which together is more than 32 megabytes. Uh, game consoles use a lot of RAM, but probably not 32 megs. Um, I'm not sure I could juggle the pins around. I mean, there is one possibility. There is a control. I'm going to have to bring it back up again. Bear with me. Hopefully this won't affect the frames. There is one possibility. I don't know if it works on this. I don't know if it's available. But there's a good cheat method. Hold on. I'm not sure if I have enough pins on the chip to do this little trick. Uh, let me just check. Oh, it takes forever to run. But you can see there on the STM32, I am using every single pin on Amalgam. I'm not wasting any pins whatsoever. There is no spare pins. If I use a pin for something, it's going to have to take it away from something else. 
Um, oh my word, this is slow. It must be using the disk. I mean, I've only got 16 megabytes of RAM, for Christ's sakes. Right, so I'm just thinking here. I go into the FMC controller. Oh, damn, I can't do it on this one. Um, sugar. Yeah, I'm, I'm limited to 23 address bits. Sorry, 23 bits for data and address. And I only have one any chip select. On some, with some of them, okay. Hmm. Ha, huh, that's interesting. This may be a feature. Right, I'll have to go away and look at that. So there were two configurations I was thinking of doing. Um, one which is based around the STM32 uh, F730 combined with the ESP5 uh, twelve K lookup tables, and then a higher end one which will be based around the STM thirty two H seven um, seven fifty, which is almost identically pin wise, um, combined with the forty five F version of the um, ECP five. So there's a lower cost one and a higher cost one. There's like a pro one, right? Now, I think from memory on the H7, I have more than one chip select line. Um, depending where that chip select line is, I might be able to pluck that out from the um, one of the other functions. And then that could indicate whether you're looking at RAM or ROM slash uh, control registers, for instance. So you'd have that extra line. But that would only be available on the, um, on the higher end version of the amalgam board. So it's a possibility. Uh, let's have a look what has been sent here the ULX 3S Z80 template let me just show on screen what I'm looking at this is something that um, Laurie has just shared with me. Let me just bring up browser. I'll turn that on. So this is the Verilog for the Z80 template. Okay.
Um, right, so which bit should I be looking at where you define? SPI slave from ESP32. Yeah, okay, so you're using thirty one, thirty two bits internally. SPI RAM BTN. Sorry, sent me another link. Hold on. Is that the same thing I was just looking at, or is this something different? Um, let's do RAM. Yeah, but that's the connectivity of the SD itself, isn't it? I'm not really interested in that, am I? That's the external. Is that the external connections to? Or should I just be looking at the? Um... I'm not quite sure what I'm looking at here. I see the SD RAM pins. Oh, I see that I should be looking at this, should I? So you replace that bit with the FMC part. Um, yeah, it is confusing in that case. I didn't realize what you were saying, Laurie. Laurie saying those uses of SD pins is confusing. They're being reused for control signals. Yeah, well, quite possibly. I mean, I was confused by them. Um, yeah, so the signals that you be provided with effectively on the FMC will be 23 data slash address lines of which the least significant 16 bits are for your muxed data bus. Then in terms of control signals, there'll be a clock, there'll be uh, any one which is like your chip select, there'll be an address valid signal, and there'll be a bunch of burst and weight signals as well. Uh, and those are really for doing your um, uh, burst type um, 
transfers so that you don't have to send the address every time. So for example, it supports you can a starting address and then it will expect you to automatically increment on each data uh, cycle. Which you may or may not want to support, but it's a good idea to support it. So it has a burst write and a burst read. And it has an address latch enable. I think it's in a not it might not be called address, address latch. I think it's address valid signal. Hold on. Can we see it? Let's just um go back. I can't read all the signals on that. Let me just um, open that here locally. So uh, on this, you will find that uh, the control signal, so you've got those 23 signals for the data and address that are marked, right? And then the control signals you have You've got the uh, FMC NL. You've got FMC NE1. Now the FMC NE1 is the um, um, effectively the chip select uh, with a potential second one of those on the H7. Um, you've got FMC weight. You've also got FMC not right enable. You've got FMC not output enable. You've got the FMC clock. And I think that's all of the control signals. Yeah, that's it. That's all of the control signals. And I think the FMC, the NL signal is, I think it's like a, is it a latch signal? I'd have to go into the STM32 data sheets. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I think it's the address valid. I don't know why it's called NL. I think that's the address valid signal. Let's just catch up with what Laurie's saying. Those uses of SD pins is confusing here. Uh, so all of that sounds like it can be done with the FMC interface, but the range of SD RAM will be reduced a bit, which does not matter for most retro computers. Yeah, so I'm saying with the with the the lower end amalgam card based on the 730 which you see the pin, STM32F730, which you see the pinouts for here. Um, that would give you effectively 16 megabytes of address space. Now it may be possible on the, uh, the kind of uh, loaded or more pro version, if you like, of the uh, Amalgam card, which has the ECP545F, if that's accompanied with the STM32 H7, because I think on the H7 there's a choice to have two um, FMC NE pins. So you'd have an FMC NE1 and FMC NE2. So you've got two chip enables. So it's designed to run two PS RAM chips. But in this this case, you'd have those two lines potentially coming into the FPGA. So that gives you two lots of 16 megabyte address space, which is equivalent to 32 megabytes, right? So, you know, you could split stuff up. You could say that RAM was on one side and all the control and ROM or flash, if you like, was on, on the other one. Potentially, I'd need to somehow um, rescue one of the pins. And there may be constraints on that. I can't guarantee that, but it's... It's possible. Um, I have recently used that template for implementing an RC2014, a TRS-80 model 
Sega Master System Compatible Console on Amstrad CPC. Cool. So, I mean, once you get it working for one, it'd be easy for you to get it working for the others. I mean, it's probably easier than the SPI in that, that sense, but you do have to, you have to look at the um, timing diagrams so that you know what all of these uh, signals do. And also there's support for burst reads and writes, which you may want to look at. Because the address and the data are muxed on the same, you know, 23 bit bus, if you like, what you want to avoid doing is having to specify the address every time you do a write or read. So what you can do is you can send a starting address and then just send burst data to write or to read from that address consecutively, you know, by incrementing the internal pointer, for example. That's what the burst signal is there for. Then you get a data transfer on every clock cycle effectively. Or as fast as the FPGA can go. Meow, 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 meow. What do you want? Cat's at it again. Maybe it wants to go out. Right, just give me a sec, because I'm just going to take... I, I need to get some more water as well. Just give me a sec, and then I'll come back. Bear with me. Um... Back again. Right. Um, the Eurolex free SPS RAM uses burst data, right? Okay, so you're familiar with that. For exactly the same reason. Yeah, well, it's even worse in that case. So it will take four cycles to just, well, no, it'll take a lot more than four cycles. If it's SPI. Yeah, okay. Um, so are we covered on that one, Laurie? Does that cover all of the retro? Uh, examples. Sorry, all the use cases. The retro type stuff. The only slight limitation here is that it may just be a 16 megabyte address range, depending on which board you go for. Um, so, was there any other outlying use cases that we didn't didn't work out how we were going to do them? 
that we are missing from the earlier conversation that we need to cover? Or should we move on to doing some of the code? I would prefer shared SD card pins rather than separate SD cards. Yes, but that has problems as well. Uh, the problem being uh, when you're manipulating the FPGA, the pins can do weird things. I mean, yes, you can have fixed pull-ups, but uh, yeah. I mean, you we 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 could overlap the SD pins like we did on Black Ice MX. I mean, did it did it not? cause problems sometimes on the black ice mx the fact that those pins are actually overlapped i'm just thinking because when you reset the fpga those pins can do all sorts can't they so on the ulx3 they've overlapped them have they so that so the same pins go both to the stm sorry to the uh, ECB5 and also it goes to the um, uh, ESP32, right? I mean, it's something I can consider. I hadn't thought of doing it on this design. I know we did it on Black Ice. Or on the um, Black Ice and black ice one and two I don't, we didn't do it on the mx so i don't think we connected the stm32 uh to the sd card on the mx you get some problems on the ulx3 but you can get around them okay um i'll have a think about that um the only big issue would be that on the STM32, I only have SPI pins. I don't have all six pins. So it's not like a byte or nibble, inter sorry, it's not like a nibble interface on the STM32, it's only SPI. So only four of the pins would overlap. <coughs> the other two extra data lines wouldn't. But that's probably not an issue, I don't think. Well, yeah, no, it shouldn't be an issue. I don't know if I'd need to actually do pull-ups on them, though. Do they have pull-ups on the ULX3? Or do they rely on the microcontroller pulling them up? On the ESP32 pulling them up digitally? I mean, you can do that on the STM32 as well, but you couldn't do it for all the pins, right? Something worth thinking about, anyhow. The ULX3 has all six pins, but in my template, I was using SPI to access the SD card. Well, that's cool. So maybe I just connect four of them, or six, whatever. Righty, righty, oh. Um... So let's move on to the code bit then, unless you've got anything else that you wanted to mention, guys. I'm not sure about pull-ups. Yeah, I've tried to avoid the pull-ups. Because also, if you're not using the SD card, right, you can use those pins for something else, potentially. Once you start pulling them up, then you're limiting the usage. Because the STM32 is capable of pulling those pins up itself if it needs to. I.e. it can be a software feature rather than a hardware feature. Um, I, I'm not sure if the... I think the ECB5 has a pull-up pin um, option on its uh, I.O. section as well. But shall we move on? Skip 
this other stuff. Uh, I'm going to get rid of my remarkable stuff. I don't need that. Turn the browser down here. Let's just turn those off. Um, let's look at my settings. Turn the image off. Turn the browser off. Let's get into the code. Um, so for the other's benefit, um, on yesterday's stream, if you haven't seen it, um, well, on the previous stream, which was last Friday, we did the basic USB CDC stuff. We're talking about the Black Crab software at the moment, i.e. the stuff that's going to be running inside the microcontroller that's controlling the FPGA. Um, so what we were trying to do was USB CDC at this point. Um, sorry, sorry, saying that. But need ROMs sending from the STM32 or written to FLAS. Do you mean FMC? It could write directly to memory if you wanted it to. It's up to you how you implement that. They could be, if they're memory mapped in for destinations that they need to go to, you can write them via the SM, FMC. So going back, so to, on the software side, um, so we did the USB on Friday, and then we hit an issue when we tried to convert it into an interrupt. We had all sorts of problems with sharing. Um, then eventually, um, I think it was on Saturday, uh, uh, Laurie found uh, an example using interrupts. Um, and that showed me the things I could do to fix the issue. Um, basically, what I've done is I've created a structure which you can see here. Um, that combines the USB device and the serial port. You need both of those together. You need to be able to access those. Um, and then I've put a, um, uh, an implementation attached to that structure, one of which is the setting up and the other is the polling. So now the interrupt can call the pole here. So rather than us in our loop every time we go around polling the USB peripheral to see if there's any events or changes, um, basically that pole only happens if there's a um, event in the USB that causes the USB interrupt. So it's much more efficient. Um, and then the one weird thing about this is in order to make this work with the example that we found, we have to use the uh, maybe uninit wrapper because what we're doing is we're sharing, you know, some uh, an array of memory that's, that can be mutated and we're accessing the thing that wraps that, the USB bus device from both an interrupt and in our main routine. And of course that upsets for us. So by using this maybe uninit, we're telling it that this memory may not be initialized, may not be safe. It's what they call a UB memory, undefined behavior of memory. And this nicely wraps it up in a certain way. However, the parts of the maybe uninit we're using are new. Um, because we're passing in a mutated um, reference rather than the actual item itself in the way that we're referring to it here. Um, and that feature is only in Nightly. Also, this feature here. Um, 
is only in nightly so we had to switch to rust nightly to make this work but it does work um, so that was a change that we did yesterday in the stream uh, so that all works nicely and then we were moving on to um, adding in the IOs here for controlling the FPGA so if you look here what we've done is we've added in uh, these are on port B so there's some pins on port B that are used for controlling um, th these are basically pins connected on the FPGA in this case on the ice core it's the um, ice ice um, HX chip and you can program this by basically sending the equivalent of a serial or, or SPI type uh, um, sequence and the sequence is has like a like a preamble piece that prepares it and clears it and gets it ready then you send the bit image over SPI pins to it and then you do a kind of post uh, amble clearing piece to it but it's basically using like an SPI uh, type um, transmission in order to program it so that's done using the SCK and the mozzie pins we don't actually need the MISO just to remind you so the SCK is a serial clock the uh, mozzie is master out in other words from the STM 32's point of view it's acting as the SPI master here sorry to use the old terminology but that's the way it's written right now and that's the way it's labeled on the circuit diagram so I'm sticking to that on new ones we may do the nicer thing use sozzy and CISO etc um, the MISO pin is is for when you're daisy chaining so say if you had different FPGAs and you wanted to daisy chain in and out of one so you'd use the output into that but that's actually wired back into the STM32 and we can read it if we need to so those are those three pins in addition to those we have an SS pin and that's basically the chip select pin okay this happens to be on a different port here it happens to be on port D so we grab port D and then we take the only pin off of that that we need um, and then we have some extra control signals um, because the serial the SPI port that is connected from the STM32 to the FPGA those pins are also shared with a flash chip that's connected to the FPGA and if configured correctly we can have the FPGA actually boot from the flash chip without any STM32 interference so the STM32 can park its lines signals in a certain way that enables that to happen that was just the way things were done with the uh, black ice um, flash configuration the flash chip actually shared those SPI lanes now it does complicate our logic here uh, and we will probably have to deal with that in a minute but um, just be aware that those lines are shared so the other lines that we've got connected from the STM32 um, to the flash and also to the FPGA are there is a hold pin um, and there is a WP pin on the flash chip so we need to control the state of those as well okay the hold prevents uh, it actually pauses a state machine inside the flash and the WP is a write protect pin, which will actually prevent us writing to it. Now, obviously, if you, we're talking to the FPGA, we don't want to be writing to the flash on those same lines. So it's a good idea to have the write protect pin enabled. Um, the other two pins we have down the bottom here are a reset pin. So this actually resets the FPGA. In order to program it, you need to take it into reset mode first. You need to change the state of the SS pin and then bring it out of reset. Then it's ready to be programmed. It then looks at the pins to see what the configuration is, depending on the state of the SS, whether it should load itself from flash or whether it's going to be programmed from our microcontroller. And then the other pin we have as an input here is the done pin. Now, 
after you program the FPGA pin, it, this, the state of this pin is changed. So if it's successful, um, that will be high rather than low. Okay. So we can also see whether we've had a successful time programming. I mean, you don't actually need that bit. It's a nicety. Um, and on the black on the ice core board, that's actually connected to a red LED as well. So when you get these problems where you're programming it with a bad bit image or you're having communication problems, quite often you'll see that red light come on and you know you're in trouble because it's not getting the right bit file or it's not understanding the right bit file, um, etc. So these are the extra output pins that we, we need to support on the ice core in order to program it or in order to program the FPGA, or the flash for that matter. Um, but the next tricky point about all of this is, um, it, in order to program using the SPI peripheral from the STM32 side, um, the wiring <laughs> for the pins is different for the FPGA as it is for the flash, because we're effectively intervening here into those signals um, and those signals are set out in a certain way on the SPI peripheral so the SPI mode um, works for the SPI peripheral inside the STM32 when we're programming the flash and that's useful because we may be writing more to the flash you know because we may have several images um, whereas we're, when we're writing to the FPGA we don't but when we're writing to the FPGA chip, we don't want to use the SPI peripheral because the lines are around the wrong way. Um, what we want to do is we need to bit bang an SPI signal. So we kind of use a soft FPI, F, sorry, a soft SPI implementation. Um, you know, running on the STM32 when we're programming the ICE uh, 40HX FPGA chip. Um, so we were kind of just setting up for that and we hit this roadblock because um, the way that the GPIO pins are, are done using the embedded HAL, the model in the embedded HAL, of which the STM 32F7XX underscore how uses um, means that you have this kind of very strange uh, typing arrangement. So if I look at any of these pins, so if we take, for example, the SCK pin here, right? If you look at that and then you look at the mozzie pin, for all intents and purposes, they look like they're identical, right? It looks like they're exactly the same types because they have the same behavior, right? They are GPIO pins in a push-pull output mode. So you'd expect them to be the same type. However, rust, um, well, not Rust, but the embedded how, the way that GPIOs are done in the embedded how is slightly complex, where it has this kind of <clears throat> more abstract uh, hardware abstraction that is um, what they call a zero size abstraction. So the, it doesn't actually use any memory. Um, until you actually implement the registers. So it uses this very strange combination of typing and macros at a compiler level to produce these pins. The result is that what you get after doing this, what is returned here, yeah, has a type called PB3, which wraps a type called output, which wraps a type called push-pull. Actually, that's incorrect, but let's just say the type, the outer type, 
is a PB3, okay? And what this returns type-wise is a PB5, but that wraps the same functionality inside the GPI, but they are separate types. So immediately when I went to think, all oh, right, well, so what I, I will do is I will create a structure with these pins in it, and then I'll create an implementation to go with that structure that does the soft SPI. Logical, right? That makes kind of sense as a structure. But as soon as I tried to create a structure with these pins, I couldn't create generic pins that I could pass in because the pin type is very specific. In this case, it's a PB3 unique pin type. So it wouldn't be abstracted in a way that would enable me to change the pins on, say, a different microcontroller. And we kind of got tripped up by that um, in the latter part of the stream yesterday, trying to work it out. And we dove down and had a look at how the SPI was implemented in the uh, STM32F7XX HAL. And we could see they were using generic typing and things among other stuff. And it all got very complicated. Uh, um, but that actually reminded me that what you can do um, in Rust is you can use these higher level patterns whereby you're not actually talking about the type itself, but you're talking about uh, the behavior as a way of structuring the items. Now, um, I probably used the word interface a lot when I was talking about that, uh, because in other languages, you normally have something that's called uh, an interface, which is like an abstract behavioral model that you've conjured or written. Now, in Rust, that's actually called a trait. And so if you hear me say interface, I actually mean trait in Rust. It's just that's got stuck in my head and the trait hasn't yet. But what a trait does is enables you to describe a the functional behavior of something without any reference to its its type. And what you can do is you can design a structure that has elements that aren't of a specific type, but that operate to a specific trait or actually a number of different traits because you can actually combine the traits so that's the way that you do it now i couldn't quite get there last night with that because it was a bit beyond me and i just wasn't piecing the things together in my head right but um, um when i re-looked at it again this morning i had to think about it and i thought well people must do this you know this can't be just me i can't be the first person that's come across this difficulty of trying to use, uh, you know, GPIOs to do something like this, you know, to have a soft SPI or a soft I squared C or a soft U heart. This is very common uh, for people to want to do this. You know, you see it done on things like Arduinos and embedded uh, things. Can you imagine if I'm on a contract or something and I go to my boss and say, oh, I've only got three, I've only got four pins left, boss. I can't do the SPI because there isn't an SPI peripheral on it, you know. He'd just laugh at me and say, you know, well, you've got four pins, do a soft SPI. It's not like this is needs to be really fast or something that needs a peripheral. Um, so it's the kind of thing, as an embedded um, engineer, you're going to need to do. So I was doing some searches and I thought, well, I'll look up, you know, soft SPI, Rust soft SPI, see how other people have tackled it because I can't have been the first person to do this. And that luckily drew me to a library called um, Bitbang uh, HAL. So Bitbang HAL is a implementation of the HAL that doesn't use the peripherals, but uses Bitbang of GPIOs which is exactly what we want here. Now it's very limited. Um, it's only got a few peripherals. I can't remember what they are at the top of my head. We're going to have a look in a minute because it's interesting to peek in. But I found that and as soon as I saw it, I thought, bingo, this is it. This is the one. 
then when I looked at it, it actually their implementation is actually quite nice, quite simple. And we'll have a little peek in that in a minute. But when you use it, so I, I now import that as a library here. Um, so I'm bringing it in, I'm bringing in the SPI, the soft SPI, if you like. <laughs> and then all I need to do with those signals is uh, I just create um, a spy peripheral, just like I would a normal peripheral that exists in the how, uh, by passing in the IO pins, the mode that I want, and also a timer, because it needs something to do the hardware timing for the clock. Um, so one of the other things I do here is I, I, I you know, I take a timer from the HAL as well, which is used and passed in. And then here, here's an example of how I'd use that, right? So if I wanted to send hello world in bytes over that, it's very simple because I can use the SPI send byte function now. Very easy, brilliant. I haven't tried this yet, by the way. I've just loaded in the, uh, uh, the, embed, the bit bang HAL, which is kind of cool. So um, what I should do is we can have a little peek and you'll see. And I mean, Laurie will find this interesting because he saw the stream from yesterday. But um, we can have a look at their implementation, see how they're getting around this problem. Right. So um, let me just change this because I need to select a different window. Hold on. I'm going to choose, so that's a black crab window. We need the Bitbang How example SPI RS. That's what we need. And I need to bring that to focus here so I can see it. Uh, so there's an example of them using it here. And they're actually using it with the uh, STM32 F1 XX How slightly different but all of the hows try to be similar and follow the embedded how traits if you like functions and functionality but if i get if we dive down and we have a look at how that operates right this is interesting so this is the actual implementation underneath okay so the key thing here is if we look at the structure that holds those pins that are passed in that are created and what you see here is this. So if we look at the SCK, look what it's using as a type. Okay, it's using output pin as the type, but output pin isn't a type. Output pin is a behavior, it's a trait. So that's how they get round the fact that this pin is actually a PB3 pin not a pb4 pin which is a different type so they're using behavior so that's what this uh where construct enables you to do is to actually set you know what you're saying here is this structure is made up of these things right where that type yeah is a behavioral type a trait I mean, we were kind of close to this yesterday, but we were a little bit, a uh, little bit lost. Uh, and in this case here, in time, that's actually two traits. So, in other words, for this timer, the timer to be passed in to be correct, it has to implement both the countdown trait and the periodic trait, because some timers won't necessarily do both of those functions. Um, and then the implementation. OK, is um, again, we were struggling yesterday of how do, how is that created? How is that set up? Well, it's very easy. We pass in the mode. Uh, we pass in the MISO, MOSI, SCK and the timers. OK, and again, 
SCK here is defined as a type, which is actually, you know, uh, a behavior. And here we're saying, you know, we're creating an SPI structure, which is defined here, um, which is mutable and um, we can also set other SPI things like the polarity, etc. We don't need to go into all of that. And then it returns the SPI instance. I returns self in this case. I was struggling a bit with that yesterday. We were kind of halfway there yesterday, but not quite. Um, and then you've got all of the implementations. The implementations here really are um, notice on the implementation here there I'm just wondering whether they're including the SPI how trait to make sure they cover all of the how functionality but I mean these are you know um, the same functions that you'd see on the SPI how peripheral proper how peripheral but the the interesting bits are um, are here the implementation can be split into different bits by the way when you're implementing a structure you can do it in two parts so here they're actually doing a second part where they're implementing the trait for duplex which is part of the embedded how trait that's used uh, to define what the behavior of the internal SPI peripheral is. And then they're just uh, basically recreating those. So you've got your read byte, and then you've got a send byte, etc. Uh, your different modes are to do with, you know, the different SPI modes and polarities and stuff. Okay. So it's a bit of insight there into how they've done that. That's more for mine and uh, Laurie's interest or anyone that saw the stream from yesterday, because this is what the good one looks like. You know, we were trying to create something very badly. Um, let's switch back now to our implementation. Sorry, to our um, black crab stuff. Where's it gone? Black crab, here we go. We can get rid of that. Right, so that's where we are. So we now have a spy device. which is really a soft spy using the GPIOs, which is what we need. Um, but there's some things that we need to do in order to make this work. Um, we need to basically, on the reception side of the USB, every byte we get, uh, we need to then send over to the SPI. So in this section here, at the moment, what we're doing is every everything we receive, we are basically sending back, with the exception of lowercase characters, which we're converting to higher case. So what we need to do here is do something useful. So every byte we get here, we need to send out over SPI. Okay, so that's what's gonna that's what we're gonna need to do here. Um, but before we can do that, we have to put the FPGA and the flash that's also connected to the same lines that we're going to use for the soft SPI. We need to put those into the right state. In order to do that, we're going to need to refer to what we've done uh, on the current firmware. 
So I need to get that up um, so that we can have a look at what we do currently. Uh, so I need to go to GitHub and uh, I need to go to ice core. Hold on. Let me show this so that you can see what I'm doing here. That would help. So I'm going into the ice core repository here and I'm going to switch to the CDC free issue branch, which holds the latest firmware. And I'm going to go into the firmware and I'm going to have a look at the MyStorm section. And if we look at the, I think it's in mystorm.cpp. What we do here, the most important thing, so after the setup, da -da -da -da, so if we're going to program, what happens here is we monitor the um, USB-C. Sorry, the USB incoming and when we see a signature that represents the uh, ice stream uh, the bit image we do some exceptional processing so where do we do the detection for that uh, hold on we're not going to do that detection on this particular example. We're going to assume everything we're being sent right now, just for this application example, is is that we're being sent the the entire image file. But um, I do need to see where that is here, how that's configured. Uh, hold on, hold on. Where are we checking for that? USB CDC RX callback. This is called by the interrupt. Um, okay, so what's happening if, if we we're in program mode, then, oh, it's done in the ICE 40 stream. So that's done. I think that's done in the FPGA CPP. Sorry, I'm looking in the wrong file. That's why I can't see it. So this is the currently selected thing that is receiving a stream, okay? Um, so what this does, so during the stream, this has a very small state machine here, okay? Um, normally it's in the, um, what you doing, Twinks? I'm finishing. Um, you'll either be in the pro program or detect state by the looks of it here. So in the detect state, which is the default state, so say, let's look for the ice 40 image or just pass it to the UI. So what, what happens is if it's not seeing the signature, it just passes it through to the UART pins on the FPGA so that you can use, you know, input on the UART. Which way are you going? Are you going out or you want to go through the door or what? Which one? You want to go through the door? Okay, go on then. So... The way it does this is it looks for a four byte signature that exists on the early part 
of the FPGA image. So when the FPGA image is serialized and sent over the USB CDC, uh, there are four bytes that have a pattern that it looks for uh, in series. So what we have here, so we're actually looking for it. So it's accumulating uh, four bytes at a time and on every new byte it receives, it compares the last four bytes to that signature. In this case, that's called SIG uh, word, which is actually passed into the constructor of this um, FPGA class or instance, should I say. So if it sees that the last four bytes match that, it knows that it started to send the um, an image file, a bit image file for the FPGA. So that's the way it works. We're not going to bother with all that recognition. We're going to assume everything's coming in is is correct at this point. Oh. Laurie's just sending me some links. Um, <clears throat> so if we, if, if we realize we've got that signature, uh, it sets n number of bytes to zero. The n bytes here is used to monitor how many bytes we're transferring. Because once we get, we know what size the image file is that's being sent. So what we, we can use the number of bytes to terminate or know when we're at the end of the image. Um, we're setting the status to one. So we're just um, saying that we're processing something here. And then basically, we're resetting the FPGA, okay? And if that goes okay, then we proceed to um, change the state. But before we do that, we actually move the pointer back four bytes because we've actually eaten the first four bytes of the signature and we want to include that when we write to the to the FPGA. So we then in status prog, from this point onwards, every byte that we receive, we're effectively um, retransmitting through the SPI. Um, so the next time round on this loop where we receive a byte, um, what we do is we write that data out. That write statement there is writing over SPI. Okay whatever the chunk of that is, however many characters. But most importantly, um, we have to go through a procedure first. In this case, we're doing a reset. Now that's a local reset function, I believe, which is the FPGA reset. So this is what we have to do before we start writing to the SPI. So, um, we set a timeout value, um, which we will use in a sec. So the first thing we do is we reset the FPGA. So we're taking this um, reset line on the FPGA low. This is just using a macro in the, uh, <coughs> in the STM32 code or one that we've written. Okay. Um, then we're going to determine FPGA image source, whether it's config and flash bit source. In this case, it's M control. That's what we've passed in master control. Um, so the next thing it does, uh, this, this is because you can actually control what the FPGA is going to boot from. So here we can tell it to boot from the flash if we wanted to. We're not going to do that. So here what we do next is we take the SS pin or CS pin as we're calling it here 
on the SPI low. Okay, so we're, the, currently the FPGA is in reset and then we're taking the CS pin low. Okay, we're activating it because it's an active low signal. Uh, we're then going to time out for a bit, 100 cycles or whatever it is, um, as that counts down. But it's not 100 cycles, it will, it will be no ops or whatever. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that reset line high. Okay, so that gives it a chance to settle the CS line. Then we're bringing it out of reset. Okay, then what we're going to do, you know, assuming that the timeout's finished, because it will t go around this loop several times, we will then take the uh, CS or SS line uh, back high. Then again, we have another pause whilst we um, wait for the uh, C done pin to become high because immediately that will be pulled down when it's when its internal state is ready to get into the next process it will bring that high okay uh, then we're going to do a how delay which I think I think that's milliseconds two milliseconds um, then we're going to free the flash pins uh, and free flash is a macro uh, and what free flash does I believe is it takes WP what does free flash do we're going to have to check bear with me because I can't remember off the top of my head so this macro free flash free flash free flash is in uh, my storm, I think. Free, or is it in the H file? Uh, free, free, free. Might be in one of the header files. Oh, what am I doing? Uh, oh God, is it in one of the header files? Include. It's so just definition of the port, but it doesn't have free. Where the bloody hell have I defined those? He can't remember. Uh, Mystorm.h. Thank you. Lloyd just said he sent me that link. Oh, what, what directory are they in? Firmware, mystorm, mystorm.h. Firmware, mystorm, mystorm.h. Can I see it? Free CPP, but not H. That's annoying. I am on CBC, issues free, firmware, mystorm. Hold on. There we go. So we were looking at free flash, right? So free flash, what that does is that basically sets uh, the WI pin and so it sets the WP pin and then release sets the whole pin okay so we go back to here 
um, what we're doing here is we're setting the WP and then we're setting the hold. Is that right? Release. Yes. So what that does, the effect of that is it prevents the flash from being written to because we're going to use the SPI bus and it holds its state. So we're now at this point, we're now ready um, to actually start writing SPI uh, transfers or transactions. Okay, so we've got to do a similar thing. So the order is, let me go back, I'll put this down here for the moment. Uh, so in order we need to do uh, We need to pull the reset down first. So we'd effectively need to uh, So we need to take the reset pin doing the delays yet we can do that in a second but effectively reset low then we need to do uh, SS we need to take low I think uh, okay. and then we need to reset high. We need a delay, I think, here. And then we need reset high. Take it out of um, And then we bring up the SS. Oh. A delay in between those two. So, do we have a delay in between those two? So, if now I have GPI and low CRST, then SPI CS. Then we need a delay, settling delay.
maybe another very small delay here in between those two. Then optionally we can uh, check the um, dump in. I'm just going to leave that for a sec and then afterwards we do No. Do a delay here. And then check done. Wait, and after that, we do. We do a delay again, apparently, and then we do a uh, free flash. So we need to take WP height. Um, And hold, we need to take high as well. Oh, it's not hold, is it? It's HLD. And okay. Right, so all of this is. Um, So at that point, we're then ready to actually write some stuff out. So um, in order to do that, we need What do we need? We need to share the SPI, don't we? With the implementation of the USB serial. So when we set the USB serial up here, um, it grabs the USB bus. So I think we need something like this. Uh, um, 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 um. 
Ooh, crikey. Uh, mm, what's the type? I'll check what Laurie's saying in a sec. I mean, the answer I think is yes, but I need to just check the uh, the state. Um, how do I define? I need to share. It's a handful. That needs to be SPI. Or do I pass it in? Can I pass it in? I construct the USB. Uh, USB setup, which passes in USB. Maybe I need to pass in SPI here. So what I want to be able to do is pass in the SPI, right? Like that. Uh, let's forget about that for a second. Let's see what Rust says. I try taking this in. So here, my setup, I'm passing in USB, USB. I also want to pass in, you know, SPI. Uh, I want to pass in... SPI. Uh, and in this case, the SPI I'm passing in is not the how, not the 32 FX how, but the This one here, the Bitbang spy. So why is it complaining? I'm missing type argument. Hold on, why is this complaining? I wonder if I do need to wrap this. But I don't quite understand why my ID is complaining. Wrong number of type arguments found. Oh, I need to change my implementation. Uh, what do you mean wrong number? Wrong number of type arguments found. Is it?
Expected for found zero. Wrong number type of arguments expected for found not Hold on. Why can't I just pass the SPI object in? For some reason it thinks I should be passing in four things. But that is a struct. SPI. Yeah, I don't need that. Just comment that out for a minute. Some reason my ID is is having a problem with this. Anyhow, let's just continue as if we were. So what we'd be saying is on here uh, we'd be using this. Each time we had a byte, we'd be doing not that. We'd be doing this. However, the problem with that, the problem with that, is effectively this is running in the interrupt. And it needs to get hold of SPI, which is not passed in on pole. It has to be there, it has to be here. So that needs to be, you know. BB for bit bang, let's say. So we'd have something here. I mean, can we just do that? I wonder if we can do this. I think it's going to complain if we do this actually, but let's just go with the flow for a sec and see what complaints we get. So SPI here. 
So what we'd have is something like uh, let uh, some USB series in our device. We pass in SPI here. Now I'm probably going to have to fiddle with this because Rust is already upset with that. I can tell. SPI, SPI. We might have to do some clever shit here. So static USB bus USB. Do we need to do that kind of stuff? Right, let's just see what Russ says when I do a compile. Because it's gonna point to a whole crap load of errors, right? So first one it's saying cannot find value SPI in this scope. So it's down here. Um, oh, self get. Self get. Self get returns option static mutate self USB serial as mut right so what we're talking about here is not SPI it's S sorry S dot SPI it's a bit dozy doing that wrong Cannot find value byte. Oh, I'm just being a donk. Right, C in C buff. So I think that's C here. Let me check the type. What type is C? I'm guessing it's a U8, but I could be wrong. I'm sure the compiler will tell me. Missing generics for struct SPI. <laughs> All right, okay. So what it's saying here is it expects four things. It expects SPI, which is made up of, hold on. I think it's expecting something like, let me think, what is this? Wow. Maybe we shouldn't be using SPI here, but rather what it implements is behavior, because SPI actually contains um, it contains a whole truckload of things. I mean, it would literally look like. Uh, It would look like SPI containing um, PB four and then input and then floating.
comma, etc., etc., for all of the different components. And that is implementation specific in this case. Maybe I should be using a behavior. What do we do for the USB? We say USB static USB bus containing USB. God damn. Uh, let's just type that out. Does that make sense? Okay, what are we doing with the USB? So for the USB in here, we're actually creating that in the setup using the USB. Whereas the SBI I'm referring to here is a structure, right? Pub structs, SBI I'm using here, yeah. Miso Mozzie SCK timer. Maybe that's what it wants. But it probably won't know what these are. Yeah, it doesn't know what those are because those are internal to the SBI. Ooh, um, why isn't it just picking up the SBI structure? That is a pub structure, SBI. Why does it need to know that? No, I don't want it to bring that in. That's wrong. It's off on one here. I shouldn't need to know that. Damn it, what am I missing here? Am 
why can't I just use the structure name and it know what that means because it's specified here and what if I put Um, it's countdown plus periodic. Crikey, I don't think I'll put that there. I still don't quite understand why I need to put this in here when it already knows that. It already knows what these are. Although having a problem with periodic. But I don't think that will work. Still don't know why I'm having to enumerate that in the first place. Oh, my fault. Should be there. I'm sure I'm doing this wrong. Cannot find trait. Mm, countdown. What else can't it find? Oh, the compiler's complaining viciously about this stuff. And I'm sure I am not doing this the easy way. I'm missing something critical here. It's telling me I should um, do that. Proceed all of these with that. Uh, Seems to like that better. Maybe that's a nightly thing, I don't know. It's kind of weird. Can't find trait countdown. Uh, maybe it's in here. Let's just wrap that and put it in here, see if it picks it up. So, 
no. What I wanted to do, I wanted to do that. And then I wanted to place in here count down. Mm, I don't think it likes that. Hold on. Is it no? It doesn't. Why doesn't it know what that is? But it knows what that is. It knows that that's input pin. It knows that that's output pin. It knows that that's output pin. It doesn't have an issue with that. But here, knows periodic, but it doesn't know countdown. I don't think it's part of that. Or is it? Picking those up either. Hold on. Hold your horses. Oh. Be like that countdown. Oh, I'm typing it wrong. That's why it doesn't like it. Will it be happy now? That's the question. The value of the associated type error from trait must be specified. Is this what they're talking about?
This all seems rather onerous, really. It's like I'm redefining everything. Doesn't like that. It doesn't like that because it doesn't know what bloody he is. I still don't get why we're having to redefine this shit. Damn it, damn it, damn it. Why are we redefining this when that's already defined? I kind of believe that we need to do this. Seems daft that we would need to do this, right? No, this isn't right. This is nonsense. I've fucked up somewhere. Excuse my French. We can't possibly need to do that because it's already defined inside the how. The bit bang how. We don't need to do that. This. This is what I'm not understanding here. Why do I need to define what's in spy? That is what I have a problem with. Doesn't it know what's in SPY from the definition here? You shouldn't need that either. That's what's confusing me now. I mean, Spy has already defined what it is. It's a strut. Or do I just... <laughs> Definitely doesn't like that. It seems to want me to define what um, spy is, and that's what I'm not getting. 
It's complaining here that this definition, right, doesn't say what it is. And likewise with this. But yet spy is a type, it's a struct. <clears throat> or is it behavior? We know it has this convoluted makeup. Why do I have to do that? Oh, Laurie's saying, I see um, Bit Bang Hal is written by SAJ Attack. He's on the ULX3 Gitter. He's writing a Mr. version of the Gigatron and discusses it, among other things, on the ULX3 Gitter. That's cool. Small world. I keep tripping over the same people here. I'm confused. What I'm confused about at the moment, um, if I leave this as is like that then what happens is when I do the compile it says it doesn't like that I've just called it SPI oh. <sighs> yeah sorry messed with it now let's fix that And that is confusing the hell of me. Why won't it accept SPI? SPI is defined. So here it says, missing generics for struct SPI. And then underneath it's saying here, SPI expected for type arguments. Struct defined here with four type parameters, MISO, MOSI, SCK, and timer. Help use angle brackets to add the missing type arguments. Right, so say I do that. Right. Then it's going to complain it doesn't know what MISO is of MOSI and SCK and timer. Right. So if I save that now, that's the same here as well, by the way. I'm at a miss as to why I have to define those damn things when it's already defined in the struct for spy itself. Then if I run again, right, it's going to tell me something else now, isn't it? It's going to say, I don't know what MISO is. Here, cannot find type MISO in this scope. <laughs> so I'm now going to bring MISO in. So where do I bring MISO in from? Well, that's got to come in from the embedded bit bang how, hasn't it? So uh, import. See, that's wrong. It's not. Not the how. Is it? That's the wrong type. Surely, let me just go and look at the um, Oh, I don't want that. Get the right thing up. I go and look at the spy definition. It uses here. It uses the miso. What does it mean when it uses miso here? It says that miso is input pin.
you know, there's no such thing as definition of miso. Miso itself is of type input pin, of behavior input pin. See, that's a miso trait there on the howl, and I don't think that is the same miso that this is referring to. Because that pin I'm passing in is a GPIO pin, not a miso pin, right? Right, so say I do that, right, say I do that, I think it's going to complain now. It's going to get its knickers in the twist because the MISO I'm using is different from the MISO it has. Because that is the MISO from the STM32 F7 HAL. Probably isn't the same as the embedded one. Cannot find type mozzie. So it seems to be all right with MISO, even though it's the wrong fucking MISO. Excuse my French. Oh, WTF. Right, let's just, let's just swing with it. I don't think this is right, but probably going to moan later now. Hold on. Let's just bring in that and that and... Now what's it saying? <laughs> uh, it's now saying, yeah, it's going to say something different now. You're right. It's going to complain about something else. I know it is. Golly. I think we're going down a cul-de-sac here, but we're doing this wrong. Definitely doing this from compiling, right? Trait objects without an explicit DYN are depreciated. <laughs> God damn. You're telling me to put this in front of all of them now. I just get the feeling that we might be going around in circles here. But let's hang with it for a sec. So what happens now when I do a compile? Let's just follow this all the way down the rabbit hole. I don't think this is going to damn well work. Dear me. Expected trait found struck timer. Uh, okay. Ooh. That's interesting. Should that be I then? I think that's probably what's going to come next. So let's just save that. Where is he getting the timer from? From there. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> God. Right, let's just do a recompile to what it says. I think we're going well, well, well down to a rabbit hole that's not. Expected trait found struck timer. Not a trait. Okay. Uh... Hold on. Actually, timer here means something else. I bet. Is there a timer?
Where would that be? It's a timer there, but that's a trait. Yeah, it's not there. Crikey. And actually, timer is something that's defined as countdown plus periodic. So... I think I think we're going down the wrong rabbit hole. I think this is wrong. Let me just go back a step. I think this has no chance of being right. It's a cul-de-sac. I think going this way around is probably better. if we're going to redefine things. Then we should do it that way. Makes this look ugly as well. Surprise, surprise. Now if we do a compile, what does it say? Why does it need that? <laughs> okay, so that means it would need Oh my word, this is crazy, man, crazy. Let's just go with it. All the way down this rabbit hole. It's 
right? And then we also need to import Let's just do this. Neaten things up a bit. Let's put that in there. Then we also need to add in here. If we need to put that. Let's compile that. It doesn't like you. Cannot find type E in the scope. I don't think I can put that in like that. I don't think I can say. I do not think I can do that. Um. <laughs> I'm not going to like this. This is crazy complicated because I'm missing something. Some understanding here. This is just insane. This trait takes naught type arguments with one type of supply. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it does want that E in there, but it doesn't know what E is. How do I define E? Because E, in this case, where does E come from if I look at their original? It's passed in. E is a type, but the type is generic. Holy moly! Reason deep here, and I think I'm doing it wrong. That's why I'm getting caught up in this.
I still like a I feel like I'm redefining what struct is when it's actually specified already. Help down, nothing else. Help, a trait with a similar name exists. You might be missing a type parameter. Well, yeah, I understand that, but Still going to complain because it doesn't know what E is, right? Surely. We didn't know what error is now. There is an enum. It doesn't seem to unused import, it's saying. Really? It's saying I'm not using this. Well, how does it know what error means then? Seems wrong. Got a feeling this might go very deep. Missing generics for struct USB serial. Thirty-seven. Oh, because I've changed this, I need to give it. Oh man. one type argument type parameter oh, <laughs> oh I'm getting myself into trouble here Because it's going to complain. Well, let's see. Cannot find type E in this scope. <laughs> Okay. I think I'm going down a rabbit hole here. <laughs> I just being a bit sarcastic here. Rust is the bestest ever. <laughs> it's not Rust, it's my understanding of Rust the shit. Could you define SPI as a static rather than passing it as a parameter to USB serial? Uh. Well, Laurie, the thing that's got to access the SPI is the pole here. How does a pole get hold of it? Because there's no parameter being passed in. And this is being called for an interrupt anyhow. How does it know what the SPI is? Or are you talking about making it like a global because we've already been down that route haven't we trying to make things global
which you can't easily do. See, the thing that gets me here is this. Why do I have to define all this shit? Because it knows what SPI is. It's bringing it in from Bitbang. Why am I redefining what it's, what's in it? That is just, that just completely befuddles me. Let me get rid of this because this is doing my head in. That's not right. It's definitely not right. It's mangling my head. Yes, I don't really stay. Why am I having to specify what is in there from a type point of view when it's already specified in SPI here in the bit bang how? I figured this would be really easy, but of course I was entirely wrong. But that's probably because I'm doing it wrong, right? So I create the serial here. If I was to pass in the pins rather than the, an SPI and then create the SPI, would that work? Or would it still complain? That I need to define the SPI like that. Maybe I'm maybe I shouldn't be using SPI here. Maybe I should be using what SPI is. Is that possible? Behaviorally. Wait a minute. What if I defined it as a full duplex trait? Would that work? Hold on. Hmm. 
what happens if I do that using its behavior instead? Holy cow. Okay, so I need to do that here. I don't think I can do that here. What's it saying here? The trait bound don't think that's in a, in a, in a, in a, not satisfied. What? Oh, now I'm back to that. That's not good. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not going down that rabbit hole again. Oh, no, I can't seem to pass in um, something that has um, the behavior here. And I can't just use this, I don't think. It's not going to work. Complain about something else now. I think I'm being an idiot here. Maybe it's just too late. Is he missing a type parameter? Word. Oh, yes, we're back to that again. Oh my god! Uh, could I define it as a static? I think I can only do that if um, hmm. Yes. Okay. Let's not go down that route either because that's not going to get me anywhere. I, I don't know if I can define it as a static. Um,
because I'm going to get into this problem here. Before I know it, I will be back to where I was before. <laughs> Look where I got that. <laughs> It's just nuts. Uh, I just go around the circles. Uh, before I know it, I'm back here doing exactly what I was doing before, but somewhere else. Just move the error. <laughs> I just end up going around in circles trying to define this. I'm back into redefining what this is. Right, and then it's going to tell me that I need to pass in error equals E. The whole thing is just freaking nuts, I'm telling you. There's something I'm missing here, and I'm just being a wazzock. And it's something obvious, I'm sure. Just going down the same rabbit hole but just in another place oh no what am i doing wrong here maybe i just need to sleep on this shit because it's just messed up you know why am i having to redefine what spi structure is is it because it's a generic structure or it's using generic types so I need to treat it differently. God. Whereas what I really need is its um, behavior. Because in order to share this from here, I have to wrap it somehow. Right? I can't access the static thing here. You know, I can't declare that statically up here. It's not that simple. You know, I can't do this, right? I can't say... Let's get rid of that. 
I don't think I can do this. So static, I understand what you're saying, but I don't think it works that way. That here. Unsafe use of mutable static is unsafe and requires an unsafe function or block. Right? So if I add unsafe function or block, what does that do? What's going on here? Why is it complaining about this? Oh, because I'm giving it a type. Right, hold on. <laughs> now it's probably going to complain about my definition of this type. Right. is there. What is going on? <laughs> it sends me round that thing again. Damn it. Whenever I try and use SPI as a type, it throws a wobbler and I have to kind of go through this curve because it's like a generic type definition. <clears throat> Anything I can think of, would that work? And probably I'm going to go down that other rabbit hole if I just put it, you know, rather than an SBI device, if I just use its behavior, okay. Must have a value. <laughs> oh God. Right, what's the time? I think I've had enough. <laughs> Need to sleep on this guys. Unless you've got some ideas. I've gone down a rabbit hole here and I can't think how to come back out. It's madness. I mean, I could create it in here. You know, if I did the initialization of spy in here, maybe. <clears throat> this is very odd. Mine's here, me, So it's like spy itself is not a is not a type almost. It's a behaviour. I think you do have to specify the full type, including the generics. Well, to do that, I would need... The trouble is, when you go down that road, Laurie, what happens is... Uh, hold on, where is it gone? I think E is some sort of error or enum wrapped error. 
Now, if you look in the declaration, right? Hold on, let me switch you over. So, if I take you back to the HAL itself, wait a minute, this may give you a clue. Um, let me just change what we're looking at here so that you can see the definition of. This, right? Can you see this? So here, when you look at the definition of SPI, right? It MISO is just using its behavior there, but it's passing the type in generically, right? Here. But when you look at the implementation, it also passes in this E here which it uses here and if we look what I mean where does that E come from it's not something you pass into the structure or it's not something supported by the structure uh, but you've got this error enum which it refers to which refers to this error E, which is some sort of communication error. Well, or do I need to pass E in? Or do I need to pass set E to no data, maybe? It's just mind-bending that I have to write all of that when it's already described here you know using the SPI should be a, a template for what that is in the first place Um, so if we look at the example of use, hold on, it doesn't give us any clues here. It just says let mutt spy because it's not sharing it outside that block. Don't see any mention of E there, right? Where the fuck does the E come from? Is the E the error you get if it can't give you the SPI? It's bonkers, isn't it?
Mm. It's not obvious. Derive debug error type. Okay, a bit stumped on that. Hmm. If you're going to cheat like this, can I? Well, let me write it like that.
No, I'm going to have to look at it more tomorrow, I think. I'm all used up. There is another part to this as well, which is the um, it's this bit full duplex and how we deal with the CS that must come, SS that must come into this somehow, and I'm not quite getting that either. I mean, you don't see that on the example. Anyhow, I'm going to call it a night tonight, guys, and we'll possibly come back this tomorrow. I'll do some research in the morning when I'm a lot less tired because I'm clearly doing something daft here and it's just escaping me what that is. We seem to have this recursive kind of type problem and I don't quite understand why we have to keep redefining that. It's because there's some sort of generic typing going on and I'm not understanding that properly. Okay, guys. Uh, I'll probably stream again tomorrow evening at 7. But I'll let you know. I'll chat down on Discord as well. See what I find tomorrow morning. Um, see you tomorrow.